الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الفاتح لما أولق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي وصراطك المستقيم وعلى آله وأصحابه حق قدره ومقداره العظيم اللهم وآته الوسيلة والفضيلة والدرجة العالية الرفيعة وبعثه مقاما محمودا الذي وعدته يغبطه بها الأولون والآخرون اللهم وحقق آماله في ذريته وأولاده وأهل بيته وأمته وفينا وفي المسلمين أجمعين يا رب العالمين اللهم أخرجنا به صلى الله عليه وسلم من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا به بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل ويسر أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم فاللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا ووفقنا للعمل فيما يرضيك عنا بجاه نبيك المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم بسر الفاتحة Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the heavens and the earth. And peace and blessings and salutations be upon our master Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His blessed family, his loyal companions, his blessed wives, our mothers, and all of those who followed after them with excellence up until the day of standing. Ameena, ameena, ameen. Thereafter, The Shaykh radiallahu an continues in the chapter of uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's eloquency and the eloquency of his blessed tongue sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he began to narrate uh, a number of ahadith, a number of statements in which we can see uh, the eloquency of his blessed words sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the types of words uh, that he used to construct his sentences and why should he not be from the most eloquent of Allah's creation when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Najm وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ that he sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam does not articulate from desire إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ but rather it is revelation that is revealed. In huwa illa wahyun, it is but revelation, yuha, that is revealed. I revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa barak wa sallam. And the scholars have said, that revelation is of two types Al-Wahyu Al-Jali and Al-Wahyu Al-Khafi Al-Wahyu Al-Jali is explicit revelation which is the Qur'an Al-Kareem The Qur'an Al-Kareem is known as Al-Wahyu Al-Jali the clear uh, revelation which came through Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Al-Wahyu Al-Khafi the hidden revelation uh, is the revelation of his blessed words sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his ahadith the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam uh, says these words comes forth with these words but in reality they are revealed to him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are revealed to him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran al-Kareem وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not but a messenger, i.e. his entire life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the point when he was, when he announced his messengership 
his entire life, anything that he uttered sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was because he was a messenger. Because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a messenger. And this high lofty rank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him of messengership, every goodness, every goodness, uh, every intelligence, every uh, wisdom that came forth from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was because he was a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he was a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And likewise his blessed words that were filled with wisdom and lessons for mankind to come up until the day of standing and yet they will not be able to encompass uh, the oceans of his uh, uh, concise and precise words. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een For uh, every single human being when they recite the Qur'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them a texture and a flavor and an understanding that others don't have Everyone's flavor, everyone's taste buds are individual Everyone's taste buds are individual we don't share taste buds with anyone, especially with you, Shweeb. <laughs> so likewise, when people sit at the banquet of the Prophet وسلم, and they take from the fruits of his blessed tree وسلم, everyone who eats, everyone who takes uh, tastes a texture and tastes a sweetness that the other cannot taste. And this is from the miraculous nature of his blessed words, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That they have fruit and juice for every single human being. Let alone every single human being, for all of Allah's creation. For all of Allah's creation. For why uh, when when, when the mountain of Uhud, when the Prophet وسلم, stepped upon it, it began to shake. When the, when the Nakhla, when the palm tree, the Prophet وسلم, moved away from it, it began to cry and scream. And when the animals had to complain, they would come and bring their complaints to the Prophet So every... Uh, uh, all of Allah's creation benefited from the Prophet and all of Allah's creation is benefiting from the Prophet and all of Allah's creation yeah, its sustainability is dependent upon the Prophet the sustainability of all of Allah's creation is dependent upon the Prophet ﷺ through the permission and intent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth and he sustains in the most absolute sense the heavens and the earth. He sustains the heavens and the earth in the most absolute sense. But when, when there is a family, what do we say? We say that this person brings the, the bread and butter. Astaghfirullah. Who are you committing shirk for? Akhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the bread and butter. Astaghfirullah, Akhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the bread and butter, not your dad, not your husband, right? Not the person working in the house. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides in the most absolute sense. But Allah Azza wa Jal has placed us in the system of asbab, means, that we approach. And by approaching those means when Allah wants, we reach ends. Likewise, if, our, uh, if the father in the house is the sabab for the rizq of the family, and uh, the, the boss at your workplace is the sabab for your wage pack at the end of the month or at the end of the week, 
then know that the Prophet ﷺ is the sabab for the entire existence. He is the sabab for the entire existence, whether people like it or not. Allah said, whether you like it or not, that's the case. That's the case. That He is the sabab huh, in every existence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have created the heavens. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have created any of the creation. Like when Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, he came out of the gardens of paradise and he said, Lord, I ask you by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam that you forgive me. Allah asked him, and how do you know this name? He said, when I left the gardens of paradise and I looked up, I looked up to your throne, I saw that you had connected your name with his name. So I realized that he must be the most beloved, huh? the most beloved to you. So hence you connected your name to his name and his name to your name. <coughs> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his tawbah due to intercession with the name of the Prophet <coughs> فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلِيهِ This is one of the interpretations of it. And the other is رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifts punishments from the believing people because of whom? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah said in the Qur'an that he is not to punish whilst the Prophet ﷺ is amongst. Allah is not to punish them whilst you are amongst them. ﷺ. Isn't that enough that he ﷺ is the sabab for the lift, for the lifting of punishment from us? <laughs> اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله vehicle that delivers a means that takes from A to B. So your car is your vehicle, is your means of going from A to B. Your job is your means of your livelihood and earning. Your food is a means of filling your stomach. Water is a means of quenching your thirst. All of these are asbab, means. And the Prophet وسلم, is the sabab in the wujud of kulli mawjood. In the wujud, in the existence of every existing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In every existing other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah is wajib al wujud. Allah's existence is necessary. Our existence is not necessary. We are jais and wujud. We are. If Allah want, Allah wanted us, we're in existence. But if He didn't want us, then there's no harm in you being or not being. <laughs> there's no harm in you being or not being. But Allah can only be. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
So the Shaykh radiallahu anhu continues in these beautiful words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says إِيَّاكُمْ مَخَضْرَاءَ الدَّمِنْ الْمَرْأَةُ الْحَسْنَاءُ فِي الْمَنْبَةِ السُّوءُ He said, beware of the green dung. الْمَرْأَةُ الْحَسْنَاءُ فِي الْمَنْبَةِ السُّوءُ A beautiful woman with an evil background. A beautiful woman with an evil background. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعَ A woman is married for four reasons. A woman is married for four reasons. لجمالها ولحسبها ولمالها ولدينها فاظفر بذات الدين تربت يداك The Prophet ﷺ said a woman is married for one of the following four reasons. Number one, لجمالها due to her beauty. Number two, لحسبها due to her prestige. She might come from a, a, an honorable tribe. She might come from an honorable tribe and she has prestige. Limaliha, she might be very rich due to her wealth. Someone wants to gain it. And number four, lidiniha, and for her religion. And then the Prophet said, Fazfar bizat dini daribat yadak. Seek, seek the one who has religion, daribat yadak. May your hands gain success. May your hands gain success and felicity and goodness take the one who has religion. And the Prophet said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَانْكِحُوهُ If someone comes to you and you are pleased with his religion and his character, then marry him. I marry him from your daughters. And if you don't, then corruption will, uh, uh, indecency and corruption will spread in society. So people, when, when, people uh, when, when people come to them, what do they consider? What are their priorities? What do they consider? What type of job he has? What, car, what type of car he drives? Uh, uh, what area he lives in? How much he earns? what family he comes from, all of this is secondary. What's primary is religion. And if the notion of religion is found, then if the secondary items are also found, then that's a bonus. That's a bonus. But if the secondary items are found and the primary item is missing, then it's like building a uh, uh, it's like building a house on water. It's like building a house on water. What's going to happen to a tree? Sink. It's going to sink. <laughs> it's going to sink before it goes up. Do you get that? Yeah. Every time you put a brick, what, what's going to happen? It's going to sink. So you're ever going to have a house? No. No. There you go. So if we have the secondary items which are the bricks, and we don't have the primary item which is earth, fertile, good, healthy, strong earth, then there's no, there's no reason for collecting bricks and uh, cement bags and all the rest of it, because you've got nowhere to actually build. And the Prophet wasallam said, Ad-dunya mada'a. The whole world is just mata, it's, it's luxury, it's, it's enjoyment. And the best of its luxury is a righteous woman. The best of its luxury is a righteous woman. And there is no, there isn't a greater and better and more virtuous example than women, than the women of the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, يا نساء النبي لستن كأحد من النساء إن تقيتن. Allah سبحانه وتعالى said to the wives of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, O wives of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, لستن كأحد من النساء. None of you are like any other women. None of you are like any of other women if you have piety. And Allah سبحانه وتعالى said to them, 
وقرن في بيوتكن ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى وأقمنا الصلاة وآتينا الزكاة وأطعنا الله ورسوله that you should reside in your homes and not uh, uh, expose yourselves ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى expose yourselves like the exposing of the early people of Jahiliya like the exposing of Jahiliya فأقمنا الصلاة and establish your prayers this is an instruction to the wives of the Prophet and by extension of them to all other women فأقمنا الصلاة and establish your prayer وآتينا الزكاة and pay your zakah وأطعنا الله ورسوله and to be obedient to Allah be obedient to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said an nisa'u shaqa'iqu rijal that women are uh, uh, the, the, the sisters of men i.e. what is upon what is a must upon men is also a must upon women so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran al kareem when, when uh, the women from amongst the sahaba asked about verses which mentioned women also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Muslimina wal Muslimati this verse in Surah Al Ahzab, where every time uh, the believing men were described with an attribute of Iman, likewise were the believing women described with an attribute of Iman. And then later on, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed men, well, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed men to lower their gaze uh, instruct the believing men that they lower their gaze and the next verse and in the next verse immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and instruct the believing women that they lower their gaze. When the instruction comes for man, it's also present for women. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divide the instruction here? Often the instructions are, are universal for both men and women. But here, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala particularly mention men first and in the next verse mention women? Because of the danger of the matter. Because of the severity and the danger of the matter. That's why the Prophet said, I have not left a fitna which is greater for men than women, and I have not left a fitna which is greater for women than men. And in the time that we live in, seeking out piety is not easy, and seeking out Goodness and purity is not easy. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, towards the end of time, people will run from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop just to save their religion. And it seems like this is the time now when people have to just constantly move, constantly move to save, guard their religion from what's going on around. So the Prophet ﷺ said, الدمين, Beware of the green dung. Why did he use the word green? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, Dunya is hulwa. It's very sweet. Khadira. And it's green. And green is the color of uh, leaves and grass. And it's a fresh color. It's a fresh. Color. Why? And what is that? Al Mar'adul Hasna fil Mambatisu. A beautiful woman, but she has an evil background. She has an evil background. This beauty will only uh, uh, please someone if it comes with goodness behind it. But if it has no goodness behind it, then how many people will it please? Uh, and the Shaykh narrates La yajni jannun illa ala nafsihi No one commits uh, 
no one commits a crime except upon himself. No one commits a crime except upon himself. So when the thief steals, when the thief steals, he hasn't committed the crime against anyone else except himself. The other person who loses an item will get ajar for that. That will be kafara for him. He will have reward for that. But the one who has stolen has lost out. No. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this in the Quran al karim also. Kullu nafsin bima kasabat rahima. Every soul is accounted and is uh, accountable to what it earns. To what it earns. La yajni jamu illa ala nafsihi. No one uh, commits a crime except upon himself or herself. And then the Shaykh narrates, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ مَنْ غَلَبَ النَّاسِ وَإِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ مَنْ غَلَبَ نَفْسَهُ That the, the tough and the strong one is not, uh, the tough and the strong one is not the one who overcomes people but rather is the one who overcomes himself. Rather is the one who overcomes himself. I.e. the one who can control himself, the one who can discipline himself, the one who can organize himself. This is the one, this is the tough one. Not the one we see on our streets uh, busting up this one and busting up that one. That's not the tough one. Why? Because the day will come when he'll be busted up too. What goes around, comes around. Is that clear? But the, the, the true tough one is the one who can stand upon his feet and control himself such that he overcomes himself, his wants, his desires, his ego, his anger, and so on and so forth. This is why some of the righteous people, what do they say? Eat haram. As Kaji said, does he know what that means? Have you heard that? No. I heard it from some old old people, they said. Ram Kaya Have you heard it? Does anyone know what it means? Basically probably a sulky term, you know. Really? You say, eat her own. So you're trying to say, do not eat her own. No. You mean the uh, anger? Yeah. And the haram. Yeah. Eat your anger. Eat your anger. Anger is haram, so they say eat your anger. So they say eat haram, or you eat your anger. The old folks know this one. I'm not old. See, disguised. <laughs> <laughs> you sit with the old folks. Yes. No. لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالصَّرْعَةِ وَإِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَضَرِ The tough one is not the one who can wrestle, but rather the tough one is the one who can control himself at the time of anger. At the time of anger, when anger reaches its pinnacle, the one who can control himself, and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to us how to control anger. So there you go. That's one of the uh, remedies of uh, controlling anger is to say, "A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim." Inna al-ladhi nattaqu idha masahu taif min ash-shaytan tadakkaru. When the when the righteous they're struck by the shaytan, they come into a state of remembrance. They come in a state of remembrance. So to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem, that's one. What else? Change of position. So if someone is standing to sit down, if they are sitting down, to lie down. No. What else? Go ahead. To make wudu. Why? Because anger is fire. And how do we extinguish fire? By water. By water. And water 
cools our bodies down. Wudu cools our bodies down. And if the anger is uh, more than what can be controlled by wudu, then to have a bath, to make ghusl. To have a bath and to make ghusl. So these are all ways of controlling the anger. Why? Because the Prophet said, Do you not see the redness in the eyes of the child of Adam? Do you not see the redness in the child, eye of the child of Adam? Uh, and the Sahaba said, Yes. And the Prophet said, That's the burning coal of anger in his heart. And when, anger, when coal heaps up, what color does it become? Red. Red. Black coal becomes red. Is that clear? And when the coal of anger becomes red, its redness can be seen in the eyes. Is that clear? Laysa shadidu bi sur'ah. The tough one isn't the one who can wrestle you down or can wrestle, but the tough one is the one who can control himself at the time of anger. Then the Shaykh reports, لَيْسَ الْخَبَرُ كَالْمُعَايَنَا News is not like witnessing. I heard from so and so and I heard from so and so and I heard this. Right? But the one who witnessed it, the one who witnessed it, uh, it's totally different than actually hearing. So for example, often people say, when I saw the Kaaba for the first time, it was as if it had never been described to me. I had heard so much about it, but it was just absolutely different to the descriptions. Why? Because news is not like actually witnessing. News is not actually like witnessing. Huh? Likewise, when people go to Medina al Munawwara, they say, We heard so much about Medina al Munawwara and how tranquil and peaceful and calm and comfortable it is. But only when we stood before the green dome, we realized. When someone witnesses that and experiences that, then they don't need to hear news. Then they don't need to hear news. And then the Shaykh narrates Al Majalisu bil Amana. Gatherings are with trust. Gatherings are with trust. So, what does that mean? So that if you sit with the people, and uh, you sit with a group of people and, or you're sitting with a family or you're sitting with someone what's discussed in that meeting should stay confined to that meeting you shouldn't go out is that clear? why? because this majlis has amana to it has a trust to it and that those who are seated here they're not going to go and leak out information to others is that clear? leak out information to others and especially if it is stipulated that this information stays within uh, uh, X, Y and Z and doesn't go beyond like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one day uh, uh, called over Sayyidina Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anh, and he said uh, he, was, he was playing with the lads he was only a young boy radiallahu anh. he was playing with the lads and he said uh, uh, he called over Anas and the Prophet ﷺ said something to him anyway. He got delayed in going back home to his mother. And when he got home, his mother said, Son, why are you late for? And he said, Mother, the Prophet ﷺ sent me in a need of his. He sent me to do something. And she said, What was it? And he said, It was a secret. She said, What was it? And he said, It was a secret. And Sayyidina Anas' mother said, لا تخبرن أحدا بسر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Child, never inform anyone of the secret of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. He gave you the secret, don't tell anyone about it. Right? And Thabit al-Bunani, the student of Imam Sayyidina Anas, narrates this. Sayyidina Anas said, if I was to tell anyone, I would have told you, but I'm not telling you to. If I was to tell anyone, I would have told you. But I'm not telling you also. But look at the trust that his mother had within her when she asked him, where did the Prophet send you? He said, it's a secret. She never said, oh, come on, you can tell me the secret. 
Come on, it's okay. I'm your mother. She said, don't tell anyone the secret. She encouraged him upon what the Prophet ﷺ encourages, which is al-majalisu bil amana. When you sit in a meeting, uh, and that's a private meeting, then what is said should stay within those people. It shouldn't be leaked out. Because as soon as the news leaks out, that's it. It spread like, like fire. There's no way of extinguishing it there. No way of putting it out there. Uh, then the Shaykh narrates, Al Bala'u Muwakkalun bil Mantiq. Al Bala'u Muwakkalun bil Mantiq. The tribulation, tribulation is uh, related to speech. What does that mean? That when people start making dua against themselves, <coughs> that's it, it's going to happen. The Prophet said, uh, he said people shouldn't make dua against their children. People shouldn't make dua against their children. Why? Because he said you don't know when the moment of acceptance is. Someone might be shouting at their children making dua against them. And what happens is that dua is accepted. That dua is accepted and that occurs. And this hadith also teaches us what? That we should also always be optimistic. Always try, try to find the positive in life and positive in every situation. Negativity can also occur. Is that clear? Like Imam Ibn Atayullah he said, Al Sinatul Khalqi Aqlamul Haqqi. Imam Ibn Atayullah said, The tongues of creation are the pens of the Creator. The tongues of the creation are the pens of the Creator, which means what? What you say is written. What you say is written. Now, an example of that is the Prophet was passing with his Sahaba and a janazah passed by and the Sahaba praised the deceased. They praised him. And upon hearing that praise the Prophet said, Wajabat. And then another janazah passed by and the, Prophet, the Sahaba spoke against that person. Uh, didn't, that person didn't have too much praise of him. The Prophet said, Wajabat. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, you said Wajabat twice for two different people. The Prophet said, Your witnessing for the first was accepted and he was granted paradise, and your witnessing for the second was accepted and he was sent to fire. He was sent to the fire. Why? Because when we go to pray the janazah of a person, what are we doing? We are making dua for them and witnessing their iman. That this person has left the world with iman. Is that clear? Janazah is a dua, is a supplication for the deceased, but also is a witnessing of the iman of this person who has passed away. So for example, if someone in their hearts believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet وسلم, and dies, no janazah is prayed for them, no one uh, he's not buried in the Muslim graveyard, which means what? No one has witnessed to this person's iman. Is that clear? And if so, and those, what's the benefiting of witnessing to someone's iman? Is that witnessing becomes a, a, a source of intercession before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the Prophet said, when the believing person is laid in his grave, two things stand up. What? The Quran and fasting. The Quran says, O Lord, forgive him for he will stand at night, give up his sleep and stand at night with me. And fasting would say, Lord, forgive him for he would give up his food and drink and go hungry uh, during the day for me. So both of them become a witness for the one who has passed away. People should always say good things, always be optimistic, always find pos positives from every situation of life. And like the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba said, الحسن, That the Prophet وسلم, used to love الفأل الحسن and he used to dislike التطيب, superstition. He used to dislike superstition. 
And the Sahaba said, وَمَا فَأْلُ الْحَسَنِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ The Sahaba asked, Messenger of Allah, what is الْفَأْلُ الْحَسَنِ? What's this? Because it seemed like a new word that struck their ears. Right? الْفَأْلُ الْحَسَنِ And the Prophet said, الْكَلِمَةُ الطَّيِّبَ A good word. To say a good word. Right? So when someone says, well done, when someone says, oh, that's excellent, that's good, it encourages the other and it gives them optimism. Is that clear? Whereas, uh, like the example we gave the other day, Shuaib, if you go to visit someone in the hospital, right, and then they're in a quite serious condition, uh, don't say to them, uh, yeah, I knew someone who had a similar state to yours and died. <laughs> you might kill them. Is that okay? Say something good to them, say, you know, say the opposite, say, I knew someone who had a similar condition, uh, you know, within weeks they were cured. You're, you're in good hands. I, I know these doctors personally. <laughs> yeah, just to make them happy. When you make them happy, uh, it, it might just be that they're just down because they've never had a good word in life. And someone says something good to them, and that's it. Is that okay? So, he used to hit, uh, يحبوا الفعل الحسن The Prophet ﷺ used to like uh, good words. Uh, he used to like uh, people saying, being positive, not being negative. And pessimist, pes, to be pessimistic or to be superstitious is to be uh, negative. And negativity is from the shaitan. Always be positive. Uh, this is very important, this one, especially in this country that we live in, for they have, in English, they have lots of uh, one-liners that are not really um, uh, suitable and they are not suitable to our religion and are, are quite negative types of words. And some, uh, some of us, in our communities also we've picked up words and we've created words and, and phrases which are not, not nice at all, right? So once I was in a car with someone and uh, we were on the motorway coming back from somewhere and uh, the person said, and it was heavily raining, right? It was heavily raining. So someone used a very, very uh, unsuitable way to describe this, right? Unsuitable way to describe this. And it just disgusted me my, and made my body cringe. Why? Because rain can either be rahma or can be azab. And if you're using disgusting words like that, then you know what it is. Is that clear? So always be optimistic when it's raining to ask for Allah's mercy in that rain. Not to say silly words and to describe it. No. Like if. You're talking about someone when they say, look, the devil stand up. You shouldn't say things like that. You should say nice words. So when people speak of tribulation and ask for it upon themselves, that's it, it's going to come. It'll fall upon them. They're asking for it. Don't ask for it. Is that okay? Only ask for good. Ah, and the, one of the best examples is of the man, the Prophet ﷺ heard about one of his companions who hadn't come to the masjid for so long, and they said he's ill. So he went to visit him, and when the Prophet ﷺ saw him, he's described like a chicken, the wings of which had been plucked out. You should imagine a chicken and someone plucks out the wings, this man, his body had turned such that he, it had been all plucked out. The Prophet said to him, what have you done to yourself? What did you do? How this, did this occur? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I made a dua and I said, Oh Allah, the punishment that is to occur to me in the hereafter, give it to me now. He asked for it. Do you get it? This is what it means. Al-Bala'u He asked for it. And the Prophet said to him, Ahem, Why were you not able to say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, waqina azaban nar? 
Lord, give me goodness in this world, give me goodness in the next world, and save me from the punishment. So you shouldn't ask for it. You shouldn't ask for tribulation. You shouldn't ask for, uh, always have good words on the tongue about oneself and about others. About oneself and about others. <laughs> Sheikh Naji, he mentioned something. Uh, when he was on the radio station last time, not this time he came, the first time he came, and he was speaking about himself. And uh, uh, subhanAllah, his, his birth was quite miraculous in that uh, he mentioned that I think he was number four, the fourth, I can't remember the full story, but anyway, uh, after a few brothers or something like this. What I can remember was that uh, he was saying that his mother was having a lot of miscarriages and she was going through a lot of pain uh, in pregnancy. So she made a dua and she said, Oh Allah, or oh, oh, the children were all dying young, something like this. See, the miscarriages were all dying young. So she said, Oh Allah, uh, this child that I have, oh, uh, while she was pregnant, she said, Oh Allah, she said, I don't care if I go through hardship for my entire life, just give me this child. I don't care if I go through hardship for this child, for my entire life, just give me this child. She said, uh, anyway, he said I was born. And he said that I didn't speak for four years. And I didn't walk for about four and a half, five years. He said, I didn't walk. They took me to every doctor, every doctor, uh, every sheikh, every herbal doctor, every one tried. He said, we, we can't work this child out. One day, he said, my mother, she was fasting, and she was extremely uh, worried about me. And he said that I wouldn't sleep day or night. My parents had to take turns in looking after me. My parents and my grandparents, they all, everyone in the house had to take turns in looking after me. I cried day and night, he said. He said, I cried day and night. He said, one day, uh, my mother saw that I was falling asleep. She thought, oh, maybe I can get some sleep now. She was between sleep and a wakefulness that she saw a man in, in a vision and that man said to my mother your child is not ill of any illness but it's the dua that you made against yourself your, your child is not ill with any illness you don't need to take him to the doctor he's got no physical illnesses at all but what's occurring that he's not sleeping day and night and the way he is is because what you said for yourself that I, I want this child even if I have to suffer for my entire life. She woke up and she was happy that there was nothing physically wrong with this child but then she realized what she had done against herself. No. So, When people say something uh, you should try not to say negative things because they can fall upon a person as they say them. Find that to be okay on Unity FM. Did they put their old stuff on, on the net? Then the Shaykh narrates to leave evil and harm is an act of charity. Sometimes we think uh, doing good is always an act of charity. But it doesn't matter about the evil we do. So the Shaykh is narrating that leaving harm and evil is also an act of charity. So uh, don't neglect that. One of the companions, radiallahu anh, he would always come to ask the Prophet sallallahu about, uh, about evil. The Sahaba said, why is he always asking about evil? And he said, so I know it and keep, can keep away from it. So we need to learn what evil is so that we can also keep away from it.
then the Shaykh narrates, أَيُّ دَائِمْ أَدْوَى مِنَ الْبُخْلِ What illness is more severe than Bukhl, than miserliness. And Allah said in the Quran, وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And those who overcome the miserliness of themselves, they are the successful ones. They are the successful ones. Bukhl, miserliness, cannot be the character of a Muslim. Muslims and the believing people are always the most generous. In this country, they then a uh, survey and they found that the Muslims are the most generous people in this country. Did you hear about that? I think so. The Muslims are, and I said that's only half of the story that they have heard. Why? Because Muslims give in open and they give in secret. Those uh, and those who give from their wealth at night and during the day, sirran in secret wa alaniya and in the open. They give during the day and the night in open in secret and in the open. And what they give in secret is much more than what they give in the open. And they give in a way which is not like others. Some people they give and they oh my god, why did I give that? They walk out of the masjid and they just regret. It's probably a good thing regretting after praying in the masjid sometimes. You see where's the money going? <laughs> Seriously? You're building up the bank account in the masjid? One million and one pound now, one million and two pound now. But what was it doing? Did you give Barclays a hand? TSP must be happy with the masjid in this country. Seriously? I mean, the, 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 the water bill is not going to be that much now, is it? People, all they come to do their wudu and go back home. The, the, it's, it's not as if they've got a, a, a soup kitchen running day and night for the, for, the, for the homeless. The Muslim sisters have to go to the sea Gurdwara to go open their fast. Seriously, there was a sister in Birmingham. In Ramadan, she couldn't go to any masjid. She went to the sea Gurdwara on Soho Road. And they gave a langar. Why? Because the money that we put in the masjid boxes just ends up in Barclays. It doesn't move. It grows on interest. Think twice before you put it in a masjid box. Seriously. Find out where it's going, what they're doing with it. If all they need it for is uh, paying the bills, I'm sure they've got sufficient for the next uh, 500 years. They've got enough for the next 500 years because they think God's not going to give them if they, if they spend. They're just saving it. I don't know what they're saving it for. I, I'd really like someone to tell me one day why, why they're saving all that money. Seriously. And they're not spending on, on young people who come to the masjid. Spend it on facilities that can be provided for the young people in the masjids. Uh, and, 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 and the Muslims, they give without using their brains, without questioning and asking. And the next time, think twice, okay, before you open your wallet and drop a 50 pound note into the masjid box. Is that okay, Shri? Mm -hmm. Find out from where was your 50 pound gone? I don't know it's fine. You know it's gone, where? Barclays TSP. That's all it's gone. Is you sitting there? You sit there until your grandchildren die, and then it might be used for the, I don't know, water bill. Seriously. Put some more bubble up in the masjid. It's become a joke, isn't it? Up and down this country, some of the big masjids have got over a million pounds in their accounts. They're not accountable. And, and their communities around are in what? Destruction, destroyed, broken down. And all they're doing is accumulating, accumulating, accumulating the wealth of the community on the name of the community to support the community, to facilitate for the community. Facilitate for them what? Nothing. How many masjids in Birmingham we have a Jummah Juma khutbah in English? How many? 
green lane. Without a doubt, for the past 30, 30 years, Jumma Khutba in English, green lane. What about the rest of them? It's become beyond the joke now, isn't it? We, we have to be, uh, all of us are here, we have to speak. We have to say to these people, if our children are growing up in these areas, we don't have an Imam who speaks in English. We don't have an Imam. You don't have an Imam full stop? I have my uncle. You have your uncle? I think it's just Shaykh Ali. He don't speak English as well. <laughs> Sorry? He don't speak English as well. It is huh? He don't speak English as well. Yeah. I think it's his old Pakistani people. He's got a different story. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous and tell me if he is generous is the last place of his generosity his masjid, his house that's the, these people they think the, the last place that Allah will be generous to is the masjid Allah is going to be generous to us in our home before he's going to be generous in his home Just yesterday, just yesterday, uh, I was in one place and one brother, he said, he, he said he was sitting on a, uh, on a television channel and he was doing a live appeal you know, for charity. And he said, one young man called in and he said, I have 5,000 pounds that I was saving for Hajj. The cause that you are collecting for, I feel it has greater right for that money than my Hajj. And he donated his 5,000 pounds. That brother who was collecting, he said, he said, I swear by Allah, within the next half an hour, an hour, within a very short period of time, a Hajj company phoned in and said, we're taking that brother on Hajj free of charge. We're taking that brother on Hajj free of charge. And our masjid, they think Allah is so poor that if they give out to create facilities, Allah is not going to give them. Allah is going to go bankrupt. Allah is not going to go bankrupt. Allah will give them more and more when He sees that they are spending it upon the young people in the community. But if they don't spend it on the young people of the community, then they'll have to stay stingy the way they are. Because then they're only going to have what they have in their bank accounts. And when that expires, watch what happens to them. <laughs> What was the point of all these buildings up and down this country, these masjids, if they can't provide? This, it will end up like Spain. Who's been to Al Hamra? I haven't been there. Like these buildings in Spain, Al Hamra. Sheikh Ibrahim said when Habib Umar went, uh, when he went to Spain, the other people forgot looking at the buildings and start looking at him. Why? Oh, what's so special about a building? It's just bricks and walls and roof. But when you see a person like Habib Umar, you see what's special about Allah's creation. You we make mon monumental masjids with the biggest chandeliers and the most beautiful marble. And what's what's inside it is nothing. It's like a big mass. We have we have big cakes without sugar. That's what they are. Big cakes without sugar. What's the sugar of a masjid? The youth within it, the young people who attend it. They are the future of this ummah. They are the blossoming fruits of this ummah. But where are they? Like Sheikh Sami said, you know, you people in this country, your children come to the masjid and you say, put your hat on the head and you make them run out. Say to them, marhaba, give them a candy. Candy is sweet. <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-azim al-azim. Ayyu da'in adwa min al-bukhul. There's nothing more worse than miserliness. You know why? You know the one who's miserly, he thinks that if I give, no one's going to give me. I'm not going to get in return. This is not the way of the Muslim. 
The Muslim gives and he knows Allah will give him 10 back. Man ja'a bil hasanati falahu ashru amthaliha. The one who comes with one, Allah will give him 10 back. This is how the Muslim gives. But that's why he's always given. Because he knows when I give, I'll get back much more than what I give. Much more than what I give. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhu was so generous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the Ansar in the Quran and Allah said, وَيُؤْسِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا That they give preference over themselves to others even if they are in difficulty. Huh? They never used to say, okay, I'm in difficulty, I can't really help out anyone else. Shway, don't make that your line, okay? <laughs> say, I'll help out someone else even if I'm in difficulty. Why? Because by helping someone else, Allah will make ease for you. Is that okay? Sorry? What did you say? No problem, bro. Yeah, okay. I think you said uh, I'm broke, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you're broke, you have to help someone out. Maybe with a five-piece five tip-top. Alhamdulillah. <laughs>